This is Mark Lane. This is Robert Groden. This is Dick Russell. This is Dr. David Mantic. This is Cyril Weck. This is Jim DiGenio. This is Jerry Polikoff. This is Bill Pepper. This is Richard Belzer. This is Governor Jesse Ventura, and you're listening to Black Op Radio. Video computers online. Archiving 44K. Hitting the 8th sequence. T minus 30 seconds. Server connection confirmed. T minus 25 seconds. Conspiracy Research. You're listening to Black Op Radio, the show NSA doesn't want you to hear. Now here is your host, Leno Sanic. Hello everyone and welcome to another segment of Black Op Radio. This is Leno Sanic and today we're going to be discussing Trying Day Books with Chris Milligan. Thank you very much for having me here. Yeah, welcome. Sir. No problem. I'm, I'm glad to promote uh, independent publishers such as yourself and things that, um, you know, uh, subversive talk, topics that aren't well known. So if it wasn't for you, some of these books wouldn't be getting out. So congratulations. Well, thank you. It's, it's been very, very interesting. Tell me a little bit about the history of Trine Day and, and how you got going, and then we'll get into the different authors that you are featuring. Well, um, first to start off with my daddy, but then uh, I was running an email list called CIA Drugs on, on the Internet, and I had a gentleman on there, Daniel Hopsicker, right. and he was decrying. He said his, he'd had a book uh, with an agent in New York for a couple of years, and nobody was going to print it. Hmm. And I heard that a couple of times, and I says, well, I've got a computer on my desk. They tell me I can make a book. And so I helped him make a book, uh, Burying the Boys. Right. And then um, uh, because of uh, research I was doing, I'd become uh, friends with Anthony Sutton. Right. And yeah. his book was going out of print. And I said, Anthony, your, your book can't go out of print. It, it had never been in hardback, and you need to get in libraries. And mm -hmm. I says, okay. So uh, I went out and borrowed $5,000 and... Uh, got his book printed, and in three months he was dead. And uh, what was the book? Uh, America's Secret Establishment: right. An Introduction to the Order of Skull and Bones. Yeah. Now, how long ago was that? How long have you been writing? Uh, that was about uh, two thousand. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you have a website now? Yeah, website websites tryingday uh, dot com, and we've. Uh, you know, it's about 40-some books, because once we started, it was amazing. I just would, you know, very few of these books have I, uh, you know, gone to somebody and said, hey, I, I want to publish your book. They, they've almost all come to me, and because uh, they, they weren't allowed to be published yeah. elsewhere. Or, or turned down right. Peter, everywhere else. Right. right, Peter Lavinda, Expendable Elite, uh, Dr. Mary's Monkey, and, and just... Uh, amazing books right now where are you based oh uh, we're based in a little town outside eugene oregon walterville okay oregon yeah west coast mm -hmm. so you know the rain we feel here oh in yeah yeah uh -huh. hey we we got here and everybody said hey it, 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 it's sun shining you know like that was you know something that didn't happen all the time you know so we, we caught right on to that that you guys have some rain here yeah a lot <laughs> now tell me a little bit about then uh the different authors that you have um uh, oh, uh, because like you mentioned, these are hard to get books or books that were out of print or, or just very rare in general. What uh, I would Well, like, well, uh, Daniel Estulin, uh, A True Story of the Bilderberg Group. OK, very, right. very good book. Um, it had sold, uh, you know, about two million copies in Spain by the time um, I, I started printing it here. And, and his agent had uh, was the agent for Dean Kuntz had uh, 
uh, access to everybody in New York, mm -hmm. okay? And actually, uh, some vice president actually uh, floated a contract, and he was soon on sabbatical, okay? But here's this book. It, it, it sold over 2 million copies in Spain, you know, not the largest country in the world. Mm -hmm. And you would think that somebody, you know, in New York would say, hey, you know, we can make a few shekels, and here, you know, we'll, we'll uh, print this book. Mm -hmm. uh, but nobody would. Mm -hmm. And the author finally had to contact me. And because he liked uh, one of the other books that we'd done by Wayne Matson, And uh, then uh, Peter Lavinda, his uh, Sinister Forces series. Uh, that had been in New York for a long time. No, we w would print it. Uh, the Franklin Scandal. Uh, that gentleman had been with uh, uh, William Morris Agency in New York. And he'd been a successful freelance uh, writer in, in Manhattan for 20-some years. And um, I would you know, been following the, the Franklin uh, affair for, for many, many years. And matter of fact, that was one story that I had actually um, tried to get uh, some writers I, I knew to, to write something about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, a couple of them looked at it and they all came back and said, you know, no, it was too scary. They had kids and they just wouldn't touch it. And so I heard this story about a... Uh, that there was somebody from Rolling Stone writing a uh, book about uh, the Franklin scandal, and it was gonna, he was going to have an article in Rolling Stone. I says, oh, yeah, right. And uh, so I, I found, out, found where he was, and I contacted him. And he says, oh, no, this is coming out from New York. So I sent him a couple books and, and says, well, you know, remember us. And a couple years later, he called us up and said, you know, nobody will touch this story. Nobody's going to print it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we did it, and uh, um, it, it's been very, very interesting. And uh, I mean, I, I just really can't list all the books. I strongly recommend people go to uh, tryanday.com right. and, and look at them. Okay, good. Well, I, like I said, I helped to promote that, so uh, I'm I hoping people that. will do that, right? I, pre I appreciate that. Now, you were just alluding to a little bit of your background. You just mentioned your father briefly. Um, did he inspire you to get into the publishing business? Well, he told me some things I didn't understand many years ago, and uh, uh, that engendered some uh, uh, research and, and looking into things. And, and uh, he was, he'd been in, in intelligence, and he got involved in intelligence when he was 18 years old as an exchange student to the University of Shanghai in the, in the 30s. And then... Uh, he was scheduled to go to a uh, international university in Switzerland in 1939, right after he graduated from college, and he went uh, directly back to. Instead, he went to D.C. because uh, the war was happening in, in Europe, mm -hmm. and he ended up in the uh, basement of the Library of Congress, working under Archibald MacLeish, who was a member of the Order of Skull and Bones and NOSS. And he was uh, actually he. My father was in uh, COI. Uh, which was Donovan's first organization, and then he uh, went from that to OSS. And uh, he, they gave him the Philippines desk, and so he became an expert on, on the Philippines there in the, in the basement of the Library of Congress. And um, then in 1943, he got involved in uh, what Peter Dale Scott defines as deep politics. Uh, they took him out of the uh, basement of the Library of Congress, uh, put him into the military, gave him two weeks of training, which was the shortest amount of training you could get and, you know, stamp their mm -hmm. uh, bottom and say you were, you were military, right. and, um, which was medics training, and also put him into G2. And uh, they sent him to uh, the Philippines to be on MacArthur's staff because they were, uh, Washington was very concerned about MacArthur and uh, General Willoughby, his, his security aide, who was also, his real name was Adam Teich. I can't really say it. It's a, it's a German name. Right. And uh, uh, so uh, they sent him on there as the personal and private secretary to uh, Dr. Hayden, who had been uh, secretary. I mean, you know, we had owned the Philippines at, at that time. Um, well, the Japanese were there occupying it. but uh, uh, So we had uh, quite a relationship. And um, then Dr. Hayden died uh, when he was in uh, this, uh, Washington, D.C., and so they sent my dad back from the Pacific to, to pick up his papers. 
and bring them back. And, and after he died, um, when I saw that list of papers that he picked up, because it was like, you know, about three pages long, and it really opened my eyes as to the depth and breadth of information that the intelligence services uh, collect. Mm -hmm. I mean, they it, this was, uh, you know, all the uh, natural resources information, all the economic information, uh, political info. I mean, it was, it, it was, I found it astounding to me. And uh, then uh, when Dr. Hayden died and my, and my dad got back there, he started running uh, a lot of the guerrillas and, and became real good friends of the guerrillas. And um, one of his main jobs had been to... Uh, get everything that was printed by the Japanese puppet government. And I asked him one time, because I thought that that was a daunting task, and he says, well, not really, because at that point in time, to print something, it took a big room and a big machine with lots of uh, people and, and, and equipment and stuff. And um, uh, so he would just compromise some people at that at that place and be able to get the copies. And But then after uh, he went into Manila, before the troops did, and sequestered the uh, puppet government's uh, library and papers. And he got sued by the Japanese government for that and got given a legion of merit uh, by the American government for that. And um, they started to put a bunch of the collaborators in jail. Well, when MacArthur gets back, he finds a bunch of his friends in jail because MacArthur had uh, been raised in the Philippines and there was a very thin oligarchy there of Filipinos mm -hmm. and most of the oligarchy had uh, collaborated with the Japanese. And my dad was helping the, the guerrillas set up their diplomatic mission and, the, and their government. And MacArthur came back and he didn't like that because his friends was, were in jail. So he said, get rid of my dad. Well, they had to bring in somebody that was also in OSS and G2, okay, because it you know, kind of gives you access to two sets of books because G2 doesn't always tell what OSS does and blah, blah, blah. And so the gentleman that they brought in to take my dad's place was a gentleman by the name of Ed Lansdale. And if anybody's done, you know, any deep research into uh, uh, the corruption that goes on, uh, they must know something about Ed Lansdale. Yeah. And so he used to come over to the family house, and um, uh, my dad then went on from OSS, and um, uh, he was still in the military there for a while. And they, he, they moved him from the Philippines to uh, research and analysis for the invasion of Japan. And then between VJ Day and his muster, they gave him a special assignment to... Uh, write about the, uh, the Japanese use of, of uh, narcotics uh, before World War II and during World War II, and he went and uh, um, interviewed the Sung sisters and, and, and a bunch of people around Chiang Kai-shek and, uh -huh. and different things about that. And uh, then uh, he told me he went through a couple alphas, and, and his, his first relationship with the intelligence was with the State Department. So I, I believe those were at State and then he was at uh, CIA at the beginning, and his last uh, overt job was uh, branch chief head of all of East Asia. And then he went covert uh, in the early 50s, about uh, 51, and uh, was sent to, uh, to Indonesia when Sukarno was, was uh, at first set up. And I went with him as a little kid, and I was CIA front, you know, and uh, spoke Dutch and Malay before I spoke English. And then uh, we came back, and, you know, we were living in Fairfax there. And uh, I was a little kid, and, and uh, my dad was, uh, well, he did odd job. I mean, he worked at a TV station in D.C. He was a, um, did some uh, uh, different, different research, and then he did, um, we were told he was an advertising salesman for this little newspaper around, around D.C. And then... Uh, in 1956, he, he took a trip uh, to uh, East Asia, and my mother went with him. We, as little uh, kids, were told that it was, uh, he was going to write a uh, uh, book about the church in Southeast Asia. And um, uh, he, he met Lansdale on that trip, I, I found out later after he died. And then when he came back from that trip, 
you know, I was a little kid, but still, things there was there was something different going on. And because all of a sudden our farm was put up for sale, and and uh, then we were going to move first to uh, Rochester, New York, and then we were going to move to Rochester, Minnesota, and we went out and got some heavy winter coats and stuff, and then we didn't move. And then the farm sold the last day that it was up for sale, and we moved to one of the new little subdivisions there in Fairfax. Mm -hmm. And we were there for a while. My dad was went back to being an advertising salesman and also a part-time uh, speechwriter for Senator Wiley. And um, then all of a sudden we moved to Tennessee, Nashville, and my dad was the vice president of a college there. And then in 1959, uh, the president of the college quit. And they asked my dad to be president, and he said no. And uh, kids, me and my you know older siblings would talk, <coughs> excuse me, and we thought it had something to do with Red China because um, my dad was, uh, uh, he, he always thought that we should recognize China. He thought it was a, big place and you know and so uh uh we moved to the west coast he moved the whole family out to out to oregon and he went from being a uh, uh, vice president of a college to being a college student and then and, and my mom had uh, went to work and you know she wasn't working when he was a vice president of a college and she hadn't been working much in in in, in fairfax she worked a little bit and uh, she started working and then pretty soon my dad was you know he was a went to be a junior high school teacher and uh, <coughs> so again i was you know 10 years old you know i mean i'm just following along mm -hmm. with the folks you know and then uh, later on and and you know and they never he, he never talked about anything you know it never never talked about anything and then uh, in 19 i think it was about 1967 or so he he asked me a question he says what do you think of the vietnam war and I was a teenager, and I gave him a flip answer. I says, you got a sack of hand grenades, and you got some rice patties, and you go throw the hand grenades and win it for the good guys wearing the white hats. I mean, I'd been way, raised on John Wayne and, you know, World War II. All my uncles were in it and everything. And, and so he said we had to have a talk. And, you know, I just went on with my life. And then the um, uh, day before my, uh, my 20th birthday, he said it was time for that talk, and there was this gentleman in town, Dr. D.F. Fleming from uh, Vanderbilt. He wrote the book uh, Cold War and Its Origins, and he was there visiting my dad, and, and uh, uh, he took me in my little brother's room and, and uh, said, uh, he just looked at me straight and said, the Vietnam War is about drugs. There's these secret societies behind it. And I'm sitting there thinking, okay, dad's talking about mafia, you know. And then he says, and communism's all a sham. These same secret societies are behind it all. It's all a big game. Hmm. At that point in time, I think, let me see, com communism, mafia, you know, I mean, I'd been, you know, stuffed under desks because the Ruskies were going to bomb us. It didn't make any sense, you know. So I'm thinking, Dad, you're nuts. I'm a teenager. I know a heck of a lot more than you do, you know. And then this little light bulb comes on my head. And I says, oh, Dad is having a drug talk with me. Because, you know, I'm growing my hair long. And it's the late 60s. I'm smoking a little pot, okay. So, um, I, 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 you know, I start to straighten up. And I'm getting ready to say yes, sir, and this stuff. And I'm waiting for my dad to tell me to stop smoking pot, okay. Because cause he, he never had the sex talk with me. I already had a little kid. And so he... Uh, uh, doesn't though. He continues to tell me about his intelligence career, something that had never been talked about. It, you know, and he tells me that they're playing out a loose scenario in Vietnam, and it, 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 they talked about a, an assessment report. And it, my memory served me that it was something about when Eisenhower came aboard, and there was this worldwide assessment report, and they had done this thing about Southeast Asia. And he, and he mentioned to me three times, he says, we told him not to get involved in a land war in Asia. And he, 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 he said that three times. And they said, you know, you don't, uh, you know, we laid out these different uh, scenarios. And if you do this, this will happen and whatnot, you know. And he says, they're following the, you know, they're backing a, a Roman Catholic uh, minority in a Buddhist country. 
you know, and he said they're playing out a loose scenario. And then he started talking to me about uh, propaganda and psychology and, 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 and um, uh, psychological warfare. Right. And, and he told me that, that when he was, you know, uh, an advertising salesman, mm -hmm. what he was doing was uh, uh, early in the morning there in D.C., uh, the intelligence agencies and, you know, the they put together a newspaper type thing that, that goes to the, uh, the the generals and the president and all that. It's their, their daily briefing type thing. Okay? Right, yeah. And he he was helping put that together. And he, he talked about sway pieces and stuff. But it was getting real apparent that I had no idea what they were talking about. I just, you know, I mean, I had no context, you know. And I mean, I was, I had, had a record store and was putting on rock and roll dances and it was the 60s and you know i was having fun mm -hmm. and stuff and so uh i just you know i i just kind of uh you know thought about it a little bit and then at that point in time there was uh oh penthouse playboy gallery and these these girly magazines had a lot of articles about the kennedy assassination and they were starting to have articles about cia drugs Mm -hmm. And so I was reading those, and and uh, I came across a uh, one of the JFK ones, and it you know listed all the theories, and there was a little throwaway line like it said, and and some people say there's uh, you know an involvement of secret societies, and it brought back the conversation that my dad had, you know, so I started to think about it about it more, and I was you know reading these these things about CIA drugs, and and I I told somebody what my dad told me. You know, some of the stuff my dad told me. And he looked at me and he says, well, you're a conspiracy theorist. And this is the early 70s. And I says, well, what, what's a conspiracy theorist? You know, so I kind of took then conspiracy theory on as an academic discipline. Mm -hmm. And I went into uh, every bookstore I could find and say, hey, take me to your conspiracy section. And, you know, all of them had at least one, you know. And so I started reading these books and I'd look at them and, and, and pretty soon... I'd say, wait a minute, these are formula books, okay? Because, I mean, I can find you a book that, you know, blames, blames it all on the Catholics, blames it all on the Jews, blames it all on the Mormons, blames it all on the hippies, blames it all on the secular humanist or, you know, whatnot, you know? And, it, it, you know, it's part of the thing of, you know, um, I don't like that group and they don't like this group, you know, oh, and blame it on the Freemasons, you know, all, all these different things and, and stuff. And so it, 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 was, it was interesting. And then... I, I continued to do a lot of research on, on CIA drugs, uh, intelligence agents, you know, uh, how intelligence operations work. And then, you know, there's CIA drugs, uh, the, the importation of narcotics, and then there's CIA drugs, um, what I call the dark side, which is MKUltra and, and LSD mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the psychological warfare uh, fair side. And... Uh, so I was very interested in, in Chiang Mai, Thailand, on, on the narcotics uh, side because it's a heroin city, and uh, I'd been told that in my lifetime it had grown up from a very small village to now be the second largest city in, in Thailand, and so I was, you know, searching around trying to find somebody that could give me some validation that it had been this small, and mm -hmm. and I'm going through my dad's papers, and this 1956 trip there he had been in uh, Chiang Mai. So I'm thinking, great, I can, next time I see my mom, I can say, hey, mom, how big was Chiang Mai in 1956? Mm -hmm. And so I, next time I see my mom, I say, how big was Chiang Mai in 56? And, you know, she says it wasn't very big, you know, probably the biggest thing in town was a church, you know, we got some pictures of it, you know. So I'm reaching up there to, to pull down her picture book, and she makes this little aside. She says, and that's when I stopped believing everything I read in the newspapers. And my mother is a very good CIA wife. She knows nothing doesn't you know i've asked her questions she won't tell me anything and, and see my dad died in in 1990 and i didn't really figure stuff out until late 1988 uh when i read anthony sutton's book uh, america's secret establishment and it started making sense of the of the you know uh, communism and you know all being a sham and, and all of this stuff mm -hmm. because it just I still have a hard time putting my head around that that concept, you know, and uh, so I, 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 you know, so she makes that comment. She says that's when I stopped believing everything I read in the newspapers, and so I said, 
Why? And she says, well, because uh, we went from Toy in Vietnam, and, and we went to Bangkok and then Chiang Mai, and the big story in the newspapers was uh, about this big battle we were having in, in Vietnam. They were having right where they were. And she says, there was no battle. We were having a picnic. So I turned the page back, okay, and there's Colonel Lansdale and my dad and standing talking, and then there's, uh, you know, a bunch of pictures of these guys in uh, um, fatigues and, and berets and, and, and hats and stuff, and, and then there's this beautiful picture of my mother, just, 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 just vivacious and stuff, and, and uh, underneath her skirt, there's Colonel Lansdale sitting down, and, you know, he's got a plate in there having a picnic, okay? And, I mean, it, I showed this to my siblings later on, and it ended, I mean, they, this picture was used when my mother's memorial because it, she just, you know, really, really, and off to the side of this picture in my mom's handwriting, it says Eudora, that was her name, Eudora, out from Saigon with Colonel Lansdale and North Vietnamese military leaders, okay? Mm -hmm. So they tell the world that they're having a picnic. But then, I mean, they, excuse me, they tell the world they're having a battle. Okay, why? Because the people in, in cities, and they have to choose sides. You have to choose sides. And, you know, once you choose a side, you know, then you can be manipulated because you'll, you'll lie for your side, you know, and you, you'll overlook leaders on your side. They're doing something and blah, 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 you know. But, and then you harden the sides, okay. And then you get a real war, and then you send... Uh, you know, American boys and girls to hell mm. for one year. Because, see, this was right after Lansdale had taken over the Golden Triangle, okay, in a shooting war, okay, because when, when the French asked it to go in there, we went in there, but they didn't leave the Golden Triangle, okay. And Lansdale says, well, you know, and they said, oh, well, that's okay. We've got our Corsicans, and, and you know, we want to stay. And so he went and got his own Corsican. Okay, and they had a shooting war and took it over. Okay, so again, they sent American boys and girls to hell for one year. Okay, because see, another thing about the Vietnam War is they wanted to get rid of the draft army. Okay, because they were, they were playing the boomer generation, okay, big time. To get, to get to the end game. Because see, we were the antithesis to our parents' generation. Okay, and because another thing that my father told me is they were, they were trying to opiate us all. Okay, but, but so they, they send these American boys and girls to hell for one year, and a bunch of them get addicted to the opium and the heroin that's being proffered to them by almost anybody that's over 12. Okay, well, gee, so where, where do these people do when they, at the year's over? Well, they go back to the United States, and they go all over the United States, okay? And, you know, not, probably not all of them stay addicted, but I mean, some of them stay addicted to the heroin, and then what does a you know a junkie do? They generally sell to support their habit. Okay, so it's an infection; it spreads. Okay, because you know, okay, you know, because I, I had some other conversations with my dad and some arguments because I continued to smoke pot. And one of those arguments, he, 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 he told me about this whole thing about, you know, the, they're trying to opiate the whole, our, my whole generation. And I told my dad, I says, well, I, I, I don't see it. I don't look for it. And I don't like needles. I mean, the, the, the nurse had to chase me around to, to get a tetanus. Mm -hmm. and it's just so, you know, but, but what they were trying to do, and, and they, they had two target dates. I mean, I mean, they had the target date of 1950. In 1950, what they wanted to have in place was the modern education system and television, okay? And uh, the object was, was to create the boomer generation as an uh, antithesis to our parents' generation. You know, war, the greatest generation, saved us from the Nazis and all of that, okay? Um, because, you know, if, if you follow the, the peace thing, all the way up, you basically end up with these commies running the peace thing that are spooks. I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're spooks. And, you know, in, uh, you know, 
in the in the 60s there a lot of times you know because they had much control over the drug market okay they would you know bring the marijuana in you know get lots of marijuana then all of a sudden the marijuana would go away and there'd be a bunch of heroin okay and they did very similar things in australia and, and in europe too okay because they needed this anti they needed this uh you know, the thesis, anti-thesis type thing, and then they needed a hat rack, what I call a hat rack in the room, to, so that they could start the drug war, they could start the assault on our constitutions, and, and all of this type of stuff. And because now there's, a, there's a great book called Generations, A History of America's Future, and they went back to the 12th century, and they, they show that there's these series of four generations that help each other go forward and, 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 and whatnot. And there was a generation that didn't cohese in the 1860s because of the assassination of Lincoln and, and the war, okay? And because of that, uh, we, we aren't, our, our society isn't as strong enough. It isn't as strong because there's only three parts instead of four, okay? And if you look from a pragmatic standpoint of the subversion of uh, America's republic, uh, there was a 13th Amendment to the Constitution that was ratified and was printed in constitutions up through the 1860s and the early 1870s, okay? But then they were able to go in and say, oh, that thing didn't, um, uh, you know, and then ratify and they they put in another one and basically what that one had to do was it was about titles of nobility and it basically was directed at the lawyers being members of the bar and putting esquire behind their name and saying you can be an esquire if you want but you cannot be a member of the government mm -hmm. okay and so um uh again they were they were trying to 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 make a generation that didn't cohese Okay, the, 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 we were supposed to be just this peace, drugged out generation. Okay, and um, it backfired on them a little bit. Okay, because basically what happened, they, they included in there uh, cannabis and marijuana. Okay, because first off, cannabis is the largest natural uh, competitor for the petrochemicals. Okay, most anything you can make out of petrochemicals, you can make out of out of cannabis, and uh, you know, and I, I've I've done you know research with with smugglers and and with the psychological the propaganda part of it, the the whole uh, marijuana is a gateway drug was it was an op, okay, to 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 lead us on, and then what happened was we did cohese as a generation, okay, we because uh, it. it the cycle of generations is a is a uh, natural uh, defense, uh, a, a self-correcting device, uh, let us say. Okay, and um, uh, so we cohe cohesed as hippies. Okay, basically around a circle of a joint being passed around. Okay, and we, we jumped aside and created this counterculture, and, and part of it was able to survive because that generation in the 1860s that didn't cohese, some of those people joined the generation before, some of them joined the generation after, some of them just went out in the woods and did weird stuff. Okay, and so um, uh, we cohesed as hippies, and then what came out of the hippies? Okay, when the, when the History Channel did their big two hour. Uh, program on it, they, they said at the end of the day, the personal computer and the internet, okay? Now, the personal computer allows me to write a book or publish a book, too, and allows anybody to, you know, make videos and do all kinds of things, be very creative, mm -hmm. okay? Just, you know, things that it would take buildings of people to do before. Okay, and then with the internet, we can tell everybody about it and discuss it and everything. Okay, and the only thing that we have from the historical background is like Gutenberg's press. Okay, it's similar. Gutenberg's press got rid of the oligarchy of that day, that if you didn't believe them, they burned you at the stake, and then brought us our republic by the books that were printed and the ideas that, mm -hmm. were, that, were, that were sent around. And so the, the personal computer and the internet are the tools that we as a society are using to get rid of this corruption. Because th that's what it is. We, we have people that are, that are uh, you know, and there's way more of us than there are of them that are corrupting 
our life on this beautiful blue ball spinning through space. And, and you know, when you look at the amount of energy and effort and treasure that is spent to control people and to do all this games and the, excuse my language, BS, okay, just think if a small modicum of that was actually used to enhance our life. I mean, we we could have a wonderful life because, you know, most people are very, very good, okay? I mean, Americans show it every day when they stand in line to get on an airplane, you know? They aren't, you know, being just, you know, very mad and all kinds of stuff. I mean, so so most people, you know, I mean, they're, they're very good and they want to do good. People, people want to do good, you know? But we've been, the psychological warfare that has been directed upon America and everybody, because basically, you know, we're, we're going through a, they're using the velvet uh, uh, glove, okay? And, and how, how, how I look at it is, is we have a secret society that's basically based in Europe, okay? And they are, they have a, a sister secret society in China who has a little brother, sister in, in Korea, okay? And... Um, they're using America as a cat's paw, okay, as a tool to get the world into shape of, of uh, you know, what they want using our blood and our wallet and, you know, going over and, and killing the Indians and taking their land, okay. And then China stands up, okay, and says, Cur, American war dog, we're China. 5,000 years of peace, Confucius, you know, we want peace in this world, okay? And by the way, send us all the remittances because we've got all the factories, okay? So their, their basic uh, end game is to, is to rule the world through China, you know, because you've already got a totalitarian state and, you, you know, it, you can't do something unless you're a privileged person and blah, 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 mm-hmm. blah, you know? And uh, so that's, you know, because, you know, if, if you look at, like, you know, your, your two oldest bureaucracies in in Europe, um, the Vatican and the uh, monarchy, I mean, they're they're both basically in Northern European hands or in German hands. And the secret society, Skull and Bones, you know, it it, it came out of of Germany. And I'm not anti-German or anything like that. And, you know, I'm not, uh, but if, if, if you look at it hard enough, I mean, and here here's my posit: it's how the secret societies run the world. Okay, it, it's it's a it's a leviathan of three levels with three parts, and the top level is mining, metal, and money. And when you think about it, it kind of makes sense, you know. And then when I look at at like Skull and Bones and look at the the list of the people who are in it. I, you know, the Dodges and Kelloggs are not the Dodges and Kelloggs of the uh, cars and cereal. They're the Dodges and Kelloggs of mining. And they got the Ansons and the Stokes and the Phelps and the Taps and all these big mining families, okay? And, and then the next level is drugs, guns, and oil, you know? And, and Skull and Bones has been tied to opium smuggling since it started. And there was a guy from Skull and Bones that helped start the Hague and the Shanghai Convention, which gives us our prohibition today, which has nothing to do with our health, our community, or our children. It has to do with keeping in place that black market, which allows them to sell, you know, plants more than gold, you know. And see, the, the hippies caused them a problem because we've taken over the cannabis trade, you know, and, 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 and changed it there and, and changed, changed some of what they wanted to do. Okay, and then um, guns, um, you know, you, you find like skull and bones uh, you know, selling, selling, selling arms to both sides. You find them at the, 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 um, the table where, where they end the wars. And then oil, uh, petroleum, it was a gentleman from Skull and Bones, Dr. Benjamin Silliman Jr. in uh, 1855 that made uh, gasoline for the very first time. And he wrote a letter. It was for the Pennsylvania uh, Pennsylvania Oil Company of New York. And he wrote him a letter, and he said, "Gee, gentlemen, I think you have some uh, very uh, you know valuable products here with a very inexpensive process." As soon as he wrote that letter, 
uh, the Pennsylvania uh, Rock Oil Company of, of uh, New York passed into hands of investors uh, at New Haven, uh, Connecticut, where Skull and Bones is based, okay? And uh, soon the Bissells, who had started the Pennsylvania Rock Oil Company, and the Townsends, who they'd gone for financing, soon had their very sons at Yale in the order of Skull and Bones. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's Rockefellers in Skull and Bones, and, and if you've ever been to Yale campus, it's all got these huge big buildings, and they're all built by, by oil money, okay? And, uh, and they proceed to monopolize it, okay, uh, in, in, in the 1850s, so much so that Mr. Diesel over in Europe said, you know, I'm... I'm making this engine because I have a social consciousness. I do not want to see uh, the small industrialist and the farmer to be beholding to this monopoly. So he presented his, his uh, diesel engine at the 1900 Paris Exhibition and ran it 24-7 on nothing but peanut oil, anything you can put between two rocks and crush. Okay, hmm. They hounded his patents. They hounded his money. Um, somebody in, in England stood up and says, hey, Rudolph, I'll help you. Rudolph got on a boat, and everybody woke up in the morning, and Rudolph had committed suicide. And his then engine then was retrofitted to run on petrochemicals. Okay. And then the last level of this Leviathan is media, movies, and quote-unquote magic. Okay. The ability to hoodwink us, to make us think something else actually happened, and then their preponderance of using ritual, mass trauma ritual, as part of the controlling mechanism. So that's, that's how I see the secret societies um, uh, and their, their control. But again, there's way more of us than there are of them. And... With the computer and everything, it's really finite, and we really know who they are. We know what they're doing, and they can be put in jail. Well, let me back up about that because you publish a lot of books about secret societies, but to the average person, they're very unaware of it. It's, it's like this other level is operating, and but in the day-to-day -day life, they never come across Skull and Bones are some of those things you, you talk about. People have heard about Freemasonry and things like that, or, um, you know, a Tom Hanks movie. Mm -hmm. but, but as you mentioned, as early in your life when you discovered that there was drugs moving, where you thought this was a, you were bringing democracy to a country in Vietnam, it was really uh, something else going on, uh, something above what you re read in the paper. And I think by the, the fact that media has been taken over, that's what keeps this confusion going on. You don't know what to believe, right? Should, right. You know, uh, should I vote Republican or Democrat? Well, you shouldn't vote at all for them, you know. But uh, tell me a little bit about this investigation of, of these societies as you have many authors on your... Um, um, well, it, you know, I, I, a lot of our books aren't, aren't about secret societies. They're, they're about individual corruptions um, that are out there. I mean, it's... It's like it's like in the in the Kennedy assassination. Mm -hmm. Okay, when when you look at the Kennedy, when I look at the Kennedy assassination, I find ducks that were put in a row before Kennedy was even elected. Okay, and I I've got manuscripts coming to me now um, uh, where they're they're talking with Richard Condon and, and other things, and there were people that were positing the the Kennedy assassination and, and writing about it in 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 the late fifties. Okay. And, um, you know, and we, we had this whole, th this whole thing, okay. But do you mean specifically or do you mean that uh, kind of behind Eisenhower's back, things were already happening oh, oh. To, to the fact that if this new Democrat got in and he was to go sideways, not invade Cuba, not, if anybody did that, we already have ways of taking care of, of someone like that. Well, you know. When when I look at it, I see I, I, I see this 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 ritual and and this play this game that they're that they're playing because you see, um, Nixon is a very interesting uh, individual, okay, mm -hmm. and 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 because see the Kennedy assassination and Watergate and nine eleven are are all connected, 
okay and you know you have other little things like iran contra and, and stuff in there which is, is basically just a corruption okay but as as far as as major acts designed to destroy uh the american republic and turn it into an empire okay these were were, were operations huge intelligence operations okay and you see because well let's let's go to eisenhower mm -hmm. okay 1952, the election of 1952. Okay, Skull and Bones' uh, uh, basic uh, candidate was, was Robert Taft. He was a member of, the, of Skull and Bones, okay? But you see, Robert Taft was boring, okay? And these uh, folks are, you know, very much into polling and, and you know, finding out where, where the people are and everything. And they knew that Eisenhower could win in a walk. It didn't matter if he was Democrat, Republican, or whatever, okay? He would win, okay? So how did Eisenhower get to be a president? How, what happened there? Prescott Bush, okay? And this is, this is in a, an oral history that wasn't supposed to be released till many years, but Columbia University released it early, okay? And, and Prescott Bush went to Shafe headquarters in Europe, okay? And he sits down and he says, well, Ike, we want to know, are you a Republican or a Democrat? And Ike says, I'm a Republican. I thought you guys knew that. And so uh, who shows up the very next week at Chafe headquarters? Under the employ of Harry Truman is Averill Harriman, Robert Lovett, both members of the Order of Skull and Bones, and the Secretary of State at that time, Dean Rusk. Okay. And... Um, uh, they they show up there, and sure enough, you know, Eisenhower wins in 52, and who does he have as his vice president, you know, but this guy by the name of uh, Dick Nixon, right? And, well, where did Nixon come from? He was a lawyer working in New York City and uh, 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 with the Navy there, and he was, he was uh, at the end of the war, winding up contracts, okay? Well, he came across a bunch of the paperwork for, for Paperclip and Crossbow and some of those other operations that the Dulles brothers were bringing in, um, not, you know, one or two Nazis, but thousands, tens of thousands mm -hmm. of Nazis, okay, against direct written orders from Harry Truman, okay? Prescott Bush, I mean, excuse me, Nixon blackmailed the Dulles brothers. That's how he got into politics, okay? Now, the Dulles Brothers, and this John, this John Loftus has, has a lot of research about that, and that's in one of our books, America's Nazi Secret, uh, by John Loftus. He was a, a Justice Department investigator, and that, that I published his book just blows my mind, you know. And uh, he, uh, so, the Dulles Brothers are, what are they? They're Rockefeller's lawyers and Bush's lawyers. Okay, and there's that famous picture of you know a, a Prescott doing putting the hat on on Nixon and stuff. And see, Prescott was head of the uh, the golf the golfing uh, association here in America, and it was was Eisenhower's favorite golfing partner. He spent an hour with Eisenhower um, uh, on Eisenhower's last uh, day in office. Okay, and you know Nixon was the operational officer. And, and one thing, too, that, that happened there with Eisenhower was is a a a Averill Harriman was, it was, I think, mutual security department. He was, a, he was the head of this thing. And uh, they went to Ike and they says, you know, because he, Eisenhower, he'd put boys on the beach, okay? He knew what it was to be responsible for, for death, okay? Well, they came to Eisenhower and they says, you know, we don't have to put boys on the beach, we can put a couple spooks in there, and we can, you know, do it, do it that way. And, and then Ike said, well, gosh, and, and you don't have to tell me, right? And they said, oh, great, you know. So, uh, they, you know, they started setting up this big, you know, uh, stuff, okay. And, 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 and Nixon, you know, he, he was, you know, he was the main guy in all, all the secret committees, the 6412 and all, all these different, yeah. different committees. Yeah. And um, so, especially in Eisenhower's second term. Yes. Right. That, yes. You know. Yes. 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 And and so and also to, to bring up the point that that Sullivan Cromwell, 
mm-hmm. that, that famous law firm. That's where the Dulles brothers worked. Right, right. So you could look up the clientele of that. Oh, yeah. And I mean, and Dulles was, you know, he was the, uh, during the war, he was the OSS agent in Bern. Uh, and then um, uh, the day before the official um, surrender uh, of, of, of Europe, mm-hmm. uh, he took a surrender from, uh, uh, you know, from the German intelligence and uh, Operation Sunrise, and then you know we brought in Galen, Galen and, yeah, and, 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 Galen. and all all you know to, with you know I- incredible deal. I mean, uh, you read the Secret Treaty of Fort Hunt by by Oglesby. I mean, it's just uh, yeah. m- mind blowing. You know what the deal that they made with them, and so so part part and parcel of all of this. Okay, was. The Kennedy assassination. I mean, there, there, there's, there's lots of, lots of things going on in there. Okay, because um, there's, there's all kinds of different threads. Okay, that, that are running up there. I mean, you, you talk to assassins. Okay, um, and they'll tell you that Dallas was filled with shooters that day. I mean, they were almost stumbling over each other. Okay, because they would, uh, and, and why, why? Okay, because. It muddies the water, okay, and then those it puts another arm on those assassins' shoulder and says, "Hey, where were you when Kennedy was shot? You know, how are you going to explain that?" Okay, so it puts it puts another modicum of control on them so that they won't talk about their other things, okay. So, uh, and and you and you you also when you run an operation like this because I mean this was a huge operation the Kennedy assassination it, it didn't start in June of '63. You know, it, 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 because, I mean, you had the Bunge Corporation of, of Argentina, okay, and, and, and Germany that made a half a billion dollars that day in the stock market, okay, from a double hit from the, from the salad oil king. And they had to prop the salad oil. He should have gone down on Tuesday, okay, and they had to prop him up for a couple of days so that he went down the same day the assassination did, okay. And so you've got lots of different threads, and, and you've got, you even have, you know, they will let people think, okay, that they're involved with the, with with a plot when actually they have nothing to do with the actual uh, operation of it. Because I mean, that's how that's and and you know you have things like like shakedown cruises. You're gonna you you're gonna have it a couple different places because you want to find out who's talking. You want to find out you want to find out who's talking. And when you look at the the players now, uh, you know. I, it wasn't a CIA operation, you know. There's no official CIA documents, or it wasn't, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't an official, it wasn't an official government operation. It was an official mafia operation, okay. And and it, right, that's where the secret societals they're able to 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 do a lot. And at the end of the day, too, the mafia is a secret society. Yeah. The Italian mafia is a secret society. I mean, organized crime is a bigger thing, but the Italian mafia is a secret society. Okay, and I, I think you could add also that um, for some like Alan Dulles, who've been fired from the agency, he still had a group of right. of his right, uh, you know, people that he could right. count on to carry out things that could still be right. working right. or just you know recently retire. Right, and in that case, you're talking about. A level higher than the government, right. higher than the agency, or uh, but a group that's got hands and a lot of these different pies. Right, and Rod- Rodney Stick has in his uh, 1992 book "Defrauding America" has a report from uh, uh, an ONI operative, Trent Parker, uh, that that they had um, uh, an intelligence on on Hoover, and you know there is. Um, Different glimmers in uh, conspiracy literature that that talks about uh, a group from O and I that was given an aegis because you know I, I'm I'm a silly hippie in Oregon I figured out you know some of this stuff and and people in the government that have a lot more resources can can see some of this and so there's there's supposed to be an aegis that that there was a department of O and I that was given a lot of autonomy and authority to look back at the government, look at this corruption, and look at some of this hinky stuff that was going on. And, you know, one of the things that, that, that you know, Kennedy, God bless his soul, uh, he, he issued some of these executive orders that started to look into these the, the slush funds, okay? Um, but uh, the, the, the Kennedy assassination, you, you had... From Henry Luce, okay, Skull and Bones, mm-hmm. okay, the Time Life Organization. What they do with with Kennedy? They built him up to be this huge, big, virile king, 
-hmm. okay, Camelot and everything, okay? Because then when you hit the king, you, you kill the king and you take his power, okay? It, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a magic ritual, okay? You can read about it in Golden Bough, which was written in the 30s and before, okay? And, and then with Watergate, what, what Watergate was doing, okay, and this was, you know, the, the first, you know, big smash against our, against our presidency and, and, you know, in our lifetime to, to try and, you know, step it down. But uh, going back to Rodney Stick, in there he has uh, the group that, that O and I showed there, Trent Parker, was um, Dulles, Hoover, Johnson, George H.W. Bush, and Nelson Rockefeller all speaking about the assassination beforehand. And when I look at that group, that is a group that makes a lot of sense to me, okay? Because, you know, there's a lot of people that are saying, well, Johnson did it, Johnson was a top dog. Uh, I'm sorry. But you would have to have Johnson on board, okay? And you would have to have Hoover on board. And yeah. you would have to have Dulles on board. And all of them would be pretty easy to, to be on board. When I first looked at that list, the hardest thing I had uh, was with George W. Bush. I didn't, you know, and there's a lot more information that's come out about George Bush's activities about around then. And then Nelson Rockefeller, okay? Now, George H.W. Bush, one thing in secret societies and whatnot, uh, and there's, there's scuttlebutt about this, is that, you see, he made his bones in the Kennedy killing, okay? Because... To, to rise in these secret societies, you have to do certain acts. Okay, so he made his bones by being involved in the Kennedy assassination. He was, he was a paymaster, among other things, in, in that thing. And, and so, um, and, and, and like I say, these are, these are multifaceted operations. There's lots of different yeah. things going on, okay? And then, and then with Watergate, Watergate was designed to get rid of Nixon, okay, because he was this blackmailer, okay? And if, and if you read his transcripts, mm -hmm. you know, if anything's going wrong, the first thing his, comes to his head is he's going to blackmail somebody. Or he, even his, his staff says, well, we could blackmail, you know, because they're, they know what he wants, right? Yeah. You know? And, and um, then the other thing was to, to consolidate the drug trade, okay? Because there had been all these different little teeny drug trades that had started, you know, in the 40s and the 20s, you know, different, different things, okay? And, and who's ever at the end of a drug trade has a little fiefdom, okay, because they have off-the-books money, okay, and they have intelligence, Okay, and, and if you look, you know, Nixon, that was one thing he was doing. He was doing a lot with drugs. I mean, he, he shut down the Federal Bureau of uh, Narcotics. He set up the DEA. He set up a, a special uh, drug intelligence operation and a bunch of things. And then also in 1960, 64, 65, I can't remember, excuse me. But Nixon was in the Vietnam jungle with a case of gold that it took three people to carry. Okay, well... They've thrown out a couple of cover stories that, well, he was carrying the gold for to pay for the Gulf of Tonkin affair, you know, and stuff. But no, because at, at that point in time, basically, you know, the tribesmen grew the opium, right, for, for pennies on the dollar, but they wouldn't take pennies. They would only be paid in gold. Okay, and, and basically, I mean, here's how drugs work, you know, you, you, you pay the, the, the tribe people, primitive, uh, you know, you, you, you pay primitives, you know, pennies on the dollar to, to grow, grow the plant for you, mm -hmm. okay, so then, then you need chemicals, you need, you need a place, you know, and uh, there was that uh, Pepsi factory in, in Laos, okay, yeah. and, and so you need a place where you can, you know, take the, the plant and the chemicals, you know, and make the drug, and then, then your next thing is transport. Then you need transport, you know, and then you get it to the, the consumer, you get the money, and you got the banks in it all, you know, just, just a cycle, okay? So um, there was all these uh, various drug runs that were, that were going on, okay? And they, they wanted to consult because they were stepping on each other's toes, you know? They would be busting each other and blah, 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 blah. And so, um, and the other thing about Watergate was Endgame, okay? Because if... Squeaky Fromm or Sarah Jane Moore would have been better shots. Who would have been president? 
uh, I thought they had attempted assassination on Gerald Ford. Right. Who was the vice president? Rockefeller? Nelson Rockefeller. Yeah. Nelson Rockefeller. And they had just changed the law for Spiro Agnew. So he could have been president for like 10 years. Okay. And there, there came to a time where, where the law didn't come to, it didn't come to so much fruition. He couldn't have been president for so long. And, but, and, and who is Gerald Ford? Gerald Ford's real name is Leslie King Jr. He's an orphan. Oh, his mother was alive, so I guess he's not quite an orphan. But uh, he was from Omaha, Nebraska. He, he, he's, he's a mind control subject. Okay. He, he certainly played along in the, with the War Commission and right. everything he was right. asked to do. Right, right, right. You know, and, and you see, another thing that happened in Watergate, who, who lost his job there in Watergate in the CIA? James Jesus Angleton, okay? He was head of counterintelligence, okay? Counterintelligence had actually statutory authority for, to be involved with drug running, okay? They were, of, of all these different drug runners, they were about the only one. And I find it very interesting now in that a lot, there's a lot of Kennedy posits, okay? They're trying to, to drop it off on, on, on James Jesus Angleton as, you know, being, you know, a mastermind behind the Kennedy assassination and, and whatnot. And, you know, he, he came in the office every day. He, 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 it, it, I don't think it wasn't James Jesus Angleton, okay, because he, he, he lost his job. He, 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 you know, he, he was moved out with, with Watergate, okay? Well, well uh, Squeaky Fromm, I, I'm almost finished. Squeaky Fromm didn't make it, okay? And so what happened? What did we get? We got David Rockefeller bringing us Jimmy Who. Okay, they put Jimmy Who in, then they besmirch him with Ollie North running his, his last thing there. Right. Okay, and October who do we get in? We get Ronnie and George W. Bush as a very active vice president. Mm -hmm. And if Ronnie doesn't know that, they shoot him within 90 days. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then Bush then takes these disparate drug things. They start running them through NSA, through Jackson Stevens there in Little Rock, okay? And you can look at the stock market. About 1982, they start putting it in the stock market and creating these huge, big slush funds, if that makes any sense. And What's then we get 9-11. Quite a, a talk. Is there any books that you recommend on, uh, on this kind of uh, American history? Uh, well, uh, there's, there's my book, Fleshing Out Skull and Bones. I strongly recommend uh, Peter Lavinda's uh, Sinister Forces. Uh, again, I recommend uh, 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 Generations, uh, History of America's Future. I also recommend uh, Gold Warriors by uh, Sterling Seagrave. Mm -hmm. And he you know, was the son of the Burma surgeon. And all of his books were Book of the Month Club and... Uh, uh, New York Times bestsellers until he wrote Gold Warriors, and he moved to had to move to Europe because he got so many death threats and had to publish the book himself. There is a version now that's come out from Verizon, but it goes in again to these uh, slush funds and uh, the uh, amazing black uh, economy that goes on that we have you know really little idea. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and I, I, I recommend any of our books because, you know, this corruption is, 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 is multifaceted, you know, and there's, 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 there's lots, lots, lots of different uh, places where, where, where a person can start and, and find out how the world really works. Hmm. Okay, well, I'll have to look into some of those titles. Now, today you're in Vancouver uh, on a book tour. Yes. Just before we uh, get to part two, uh, why don't you just uh, introduce uh, this, well, this book and, and, and what made you get behind it? Well, um, we're here to uh, support Judith Berry Baker and her book, uh, Me and Lee, How I Came to Know, Love, and Lose uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, because um, it's an amazing book. Uh, that really fills in history of the Kennedy assassination uh, because she knew Lee Oswald. And, you know, I, I'd studied it a long time, and, you know, there was these, 
you know, a few anomalies that would always pop up. They didn't make any sense, mm -hmm. you know. You read Judy's book, and wow, they make sense. Because, you know, I, I knew Lee was a patsy, okay, you know, and basically what does a patsy do? You know, he, he, he puts his name out there, puts a frame around him, and dies, you know. And, and you know, and I, I knew that, you know, you know, I, I, you know, I felt that, you know, he was, he was intelligence, you know, he, he, you know, he, he had to be, you know, some sort of intelligence agent and, and it just, uh, brought all of that, uh, much clearer. And, you know, I mean, Judy's book started when, when first, when a gentleman, Ed Haslam, mm -hmm. uh, called me up one day and, and, uh, said, would I want to publish his book? And he had come out with a book called Mary Fairy and the Monkey Virus. And, uh, uh, it was an amazing book, and I, I knew of it, and, and I said, "Sure, Ed. You know, it, it needs to it, it it needs to hit a wider audience and stuff." And um, so uh, he sent it to us, and, and we were we were updating it, and uh, came up with the name Doctor Mary's Monkey, and then he had a, a chapter in there and uh, uh, about Judy, and because he had done uh, this book, had Ed was born to write that book <laughs> it's the only thing i can say you know i mean he he sat on dr mary sherman's uh lap when he was a kid his, his dad knew him and, and he had a he had a girlfriend that had had rented one of david ferry's houses you know i mean it just uh, the story bumped into him so many times it was wasn't funny and he had actually gone out and he had tried to get other people to write it because he wasn't a writer and somebody says well why don't you write it and so so he did and, and published it himself and caught a lot of derision because he included this posit about how um, the contamination of the polio vaccine. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, but, you know, now there's a book called The Virus and the Vaccine that goes through a chapter and verse. And so we, we printed his book, and, and I knew about Judy, and I, I knew there had been some problems in, 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 in trying to get her, her book published. And, and so... Um, it took a little while for us to, to get together, but uh, uh, she sent her uh, his book, her book, and I looked at, at her, her, her manuscript and her documentation, and her documentation was just overwhelming, just, 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 just absolutely overwhelming. And, you know, I've been, uh, you know, dealing with, with looking into uh, secret stuff for a long time, you know, secret societies, uh, drug smuggling, um, intelligence agencies, and they don't always leave a lot of documentation saying, okay, this is what we're doing, okay, but, but let's say they leave spoor, okay, they, they leave tracks, they, 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 leave, they leave trails, and, and, and you, you can read them, you know, you, yeah. you, you can, footprints, you, right, right, and you, you can, you, you can see what they, they were doing, and, and so, you know, it, again, like with with her documentation, and then you know, the, it, it was just overwhelming. So it, 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 you know, it took it took time to 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 go through the documentation, to to verify the documentation, uh, and, and 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 to put it together, and then, uh, this is a story that has two strong vested interests against it, okay? It has the Oswald did it, okay, vested interest. Mm -hmm. And then it has, which I think is almost a larger vested interest, the cancer industry. And, and the whole story of what has happened, that history of the contaminated polio vaccine, because, you know, I... I uh, done some promotion and different things. I mean, one, one thing, I, I wrote a letter to the editor. And in the middle of the, the letter, they just took out my little sentence about, and all the, uh, the school kids that were inoculated with contaminated monkey, you know, they, they took that out, you know. And I complained, oh, you still got your thing. And I said, no, you took <laughs> and And so, you know, it, the story has been suppressed. 
I mean, she was talking with a, uh, uh, you know, there's a story in Publishers Weekly about this, about her story in 1999. She had an agent, okay? And, and you know, 60 Minutes looked at it uh, for a long time, uh, you know, and then it was, it was shut down from higher ups. And I mean, and I've dealt with 60 Minutes on, on some of her other books. And, and uh, you know, uh, if, if, if a story doesn't go along with what the... Uh, per, prevailing whatever it is you know they they just won't touch it okay yeah. they'll tell you oh oh hold on to that story oh sequester will you sequester it for a while and blah 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 and then they don't do anything or they do exactly that exactly yeah. the opposite okay and so um we uh, uh we, we we published it and and you know i'd like to say just 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 a few things about uh judy and about me and Lee, because it's not hard. It's not easy being Judith Ferry Baker, okay? Because ever since she came out in 1999, she's been viciously, viciously attacked. Her, you know, uh, uh, you you attack the the messenger, you know. I mean, it's just, she's just been viciously attacked, and so. It's it's just been very very interesting to we you know we we came out with a book I we didn't have an author in the United States you know and we couldn't you know do the normal thing and say hey Lynn you want to want to talk to her on the radio and stuff and you know and and things like this because you know she wasn't available okay because you know uh, she you know like. Uh, uh, Mr. Seagrave had, had gotten death threats, and I mean, she'd been in the hospital and all kinds of other things. Okay, for just speaking out. And so, uh, when the when the uh, soft cover came out, we says, Judy, you know, maybe maybe we can come to Canada. You know, would, would you come to Canada? You know, so we came to Toronto. And, you know, I've done, you know, things where I've gone to other cities in the United States. I did it with Dr. Mary's Monkey, went to New Orleans, you know, planted my flag and had a press conference. And, you know, one guy showed up. He had a hunting show uh, on Saturday morning for two hours. He did give it to us, you know. But, you know, the press, you know, was a no-show, basically. Yeah. Okay. We went to Toronto. Judith was on the CNN of, of, of Canada. We got her on a bunch of the, the TV stations in Toronto. She was on the front page of the paper uh, there. And it, it, was, it was an amazing experience for myself as, as a publisher of suppressed material. And it was, it was, it was a great experience, you know, I, I hope for, for Judith, okay? And, and, and we, we, we celebrated Lee Harvey Oswald's birthday. You know, this, this, this person that, you know, everybody is, you know, He's your bad guy, you know, he killed the president, you know, and stuff like this. And we celebrate his birthday, which, which, and there's a, there's a, a store in Toronto called, uh, you know, that it, it worked out very well. It, it was very, very nice. And so um, Judith went back to uh, exile in Europe and, uh, you know, and all those stories in Toronto, even though Buffalo is pretty close, they stayed in Toronto. Okay, it 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 didn't it didn't it didn't jump the yeah. falls there and, and get to Buffalo or anywhere. Okay, well, Judith is very passionate about this story. Okay, and she knew that next year, the fiftieth anniversary, yeah. there's going to be you know Lee did it, Lee did it, Lee did it. Here's how he did it. You know they're going to show us another another time. You know, and and so she wanted to confront it. You know. And um, uh, she uh, first she she made a she was going to go to Dallas, okay. She made a reservation for Dallas, and even though she wasn't at her house, and but and she was someplace else, and they called her on the phone and says, "Judy, you better not do that. You're going to pay." And you know things happen, and you know so so we said, "Well, listen, let's come to the West Coast here." Okay, because on the West Coast, we've got all those people who kept going over the next hill saying, hey, leave us alone, you know. And, and there is, you know, I, I think there's, there's a little bit more respect for freedom and, and stuff on, on the West Coast. And we're based in the West Coast, and it would be easier for, for us to do because, um, and so uh, uh, we did a thing on Kickstarter. 
and and we're able to to get that done and and uh, here we are and we are getting some uh some good good media some good media you know and and, and it's really really happy uh to see and you know i i get a little upset i mean they they always ask judy you know well uh, okay who who killed kennedy you know and you know uh, Judith has her ideas about who killed Kennedy, and like like many of us do, you know. But she knows she doesn't know who killed him. She knows who didn't kill him, you know. And and so, um, and it wasn't Lee. No, it wasn't Lee. It wasn't. It wasn't Lee. So you know, it, it, it's been a very. It's just been a pleasure to you know uh, to sit and and uh, she's done a lot of interviews, and, and Judith has a interesting philosophy about interviews you know uh, you get some people and you know they get their sound bite and they get it down somebody asks them a question and that's it you know and somebody else asks them the question they basically get the same answer mm-hmm. well you know judith told me one time well she says you know i i think they, they deserve something different you know so so you know she'll answer the questions different you know i mean she'll you know basically be you know giving them you know similar information same information you know the truth but but she'll she'll you know and so um it it been because you know she is who she says she is you know and and she was involved with this secret project and everybody else that was involved with that secret project is dead okay one of them dr mary sherman Okay, they murdered her, stabbed her fourteen times, uh, lit fire to her body, um, and her her right arm was missing. Okay, and this was on the front page of the papers when the Warren Commission came to town to say, "Hey, is there anybody out there that knows anything about the uh, Kennedy assassination or anything?" You know, I think that would you'd want to come if you knew about the secret project. Yeah, you know, right, and, and, and whatnot. You know, so. It, it's it's it, it's again it, it's interesting in, in watching the dynamics, okay, of, of of this because like you know when when Judith first came they they said oh well she's just a crazy lady you know and then they say well she's just a crazy lady and and maybe she was in New Orleans okay well yeah she's a, maybe she was in New Orleans and maybe she knew Lee but still she's just a crazy lady you know and and so they 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 go and, and, and all these all these silly games you know when. You know, when, when we've had these, uh, uh, we're having press conferences, because basically what this is is a media tour, okay? Because we, we want to break this story, because this is an amazing story. It's an amazing story that, that covers, uh, you know, several facets of, of America's uh, secret history. And, you know, and she's one of the last living witnesses to this. And she knew people like Guy Bannister. She met Clay Shaw. You know, she met David, she was introduced to David Ferry as Dr. Ferry, you know, and, and we always, you know, what was David Ferry running around with these white mice and all this, all this crazy stuff, Mm -hmm. you know? And so, you know, um, she's an uh, amazing living resource, you know, because we can read about it in books, but, you know, we don't, we don't have any, any personal recollection of, of anything. You know, so I, I, that's what I'm trying to facilitate. And, and when we do these press conferences, one thing I, I end them with, you know, because, you know, we, we are getting some people of, of the working press, you know, uh, that have television stations and stuff like that. And I say, you know, we're just a small press. OK, we, we brought this story to your attention, you know, but we'd really like you guys to get involved and tell the people so that, you know, we can have some honest discussion. Because as long as, you know, stuff is just over here, it's conspiracy, you know, we as, we as a country, we don't have honest discussions, you know, and that's, that's what we need, you know, because by discussing things, by dialogue, we can, you know, figure out our problems and, and you know, and advance because it's, uh, it, it's really sad. It, I mean... You know, I, I'm old enough to, you know, I remember, you know, when I was a kid, you know, towns had, you know, two or three newspapers. You had a morning newspaper. You had an afternoon news, newspaper. You, you had, you know, lots of, you know, chance for a difference of opinion, yeah. you know. And, you know, Lord have mercy, I, I, you know, I worry about, you know, our children, 
You know, I, I worry about, you know, what, what opportunities they're going to have, what, you know, what, what role they're going to get to play in life. Are, are they going to actually make decisions or are they just, you know, going to be slaves, you know? And so, um, that's, that's, you know, I do have an agenda. It's the Constitution of the United States and our children. I have a sub-agenda of getting rid of the prohibition and getting, you know, corporations aren't people, you know. Yeah, I never thought that. That's, that's ridiculous. People and so, are people. And, and, you know, and so uh, it, it's just been a pleasure to, to you know, know a, a, a living witness to present her story. And, you know, I, I felt that with the book, I was taking, you know, helping to take Judy out of hell that she was living in, just being attacked and, and not having, you know, well, here's my story. Here, you know, here, here, look at this. This is, this is, this is what is, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, now let's talk about it, you know, because you, you can't, there's nothing with a bunch of bickering, okay? And so with the book, we, we, we took her out of purgatory. We took her up, out, out of hell up to purgatory, okay? And now with the, with the media tour, we're, we're, we're getting, so she doesn't have to live in exile, you know, overseas, but she can walk on the earth and, and tell her story and, and be one of us. So that's what we're doing here. Okay, well, a continued uh, success with Trine Day. You want to mention the website again? It's trineday.com, right. uh, T-R-I-N-E-D-A-Y. And Len, I really appreciate you, know, you having me on. It's, yeah, no uh, problem. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. You've been listening to Black Op Radio, broadcasting weekly from the Fiasco Brothers Recording Studio in Vancouver, Canada. You're listening to the Fiasco Brothers Radio Network.